keynote speaker is Dr. Adam DeVilla in the Theology and Philosophy Department here at St. Francis. Um, Dr. DeVille is um, the editor of the international juried journal Logos, a journal of Eastern Christian studies. When um, Dr. DeVille uses the term East, as in the title of tonight's talk, you can be pretty sure he probably means um, Eastern Orthodoxy. So uh, he is um, the author of Orthodoxy and the Roman Papacy, with Unum Sint and the Prospects of East-West Unity, um, which was published earlier this year by the University of Notre Dame Press. And he is the um, editor of the blog Eastern Christian Books uh, blogspot.com. Uh, in addition, he has authored over 100 articles and reviews in both popular and juried journals in Europe and North America. Um, his current projects are three. Uh, he's writing a chapter on the church as an invited contribution to the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Ecumenical Studies, um, and uh, a book under contract with T and T Clark of London, tentatively titled "Sexual Differentiation and the Christian East: Sources, Ancient and Modern." And he is editing an anthology of articles by scholars around the world, um, tentatively titled Eastern Christianity and the Encounter with Islam, likely to be published in 2014. So as you can see, Dr. Deville um, studies a lot uh, in terms of ecumenical studies and the encounters of different religious traditions. So if you would uh, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Adam It's a great um, delight to be here because I've been able to um, do some research for this presentation and some writing on a topic that um, I don't generally have uh, an occasion to be able to do. Um, I've had a long-standing interest in and uh, fascination with the life and the works of, of the English writer Yves Lenoir, um, but it's not a topic that lends itself to a lot of sort of undergraduate theology courses or a lot of the current writing I've been uh, doing. So. I'm, I'm very glad to be asked to, to uh, give this uh, presentation this afternoon. Um, uh, I've, uh, there are copies I've distributed of the outline there that I, I'm going to uh, follow just to um, um, give you a sense of sort of where I'm going. Um, for much of the last century, we've seen an attempt by a variety of scholars to conceive of a typology of human responses to the divine, to the mystery of the divine, to use part of our conference title. Uh, and many of you are probably aware of two of the uh, most widely cited of those um, scholarly analysis. Uh, the first, of course, was William James' The Variety of Religious Experiences, published in 1902 after being given the previous year as the Gifford Lectures in Scotland. And not long after, in 1908, Baron von Hugel's text, The Mystical Element of Religion, supplemented later by the publication of many of his uh, letters to various people who wrote to him with questions about mysticism, about God, about spirituality, and about the divine. Uh, now, both James and von Hugel were uh, Western scholars operating out of Western Christian traditions. Uh, James, a sort of vaguely Protestant psychologist at Harvard, and von Hugel, an English uh, Roman Catholic. Neither of them uh, paid much attention uh, to a response to divine mystery that finds its fullest, uh, indeed, paradigmatic expression in the Orthodox Christian East. Uh, first in the Eastern Roman Empire, and then later in the East Slavic lands of what we today know as Ukraine and Russia. That response, in brief, consists of the Christian who feigns, and perhaps in some cases actually undergoes, a period of madness in which he or she acts at ways utterly at odds with all the expectations of what constitutes um, respectable or pious behavior. The behavior of these characters, in fact, is so erratic and so disturbing that they often cross the line between eccentricity and insanity, and seem to do so quite deliberately for reasons that we'll look at. The behavior of these characters that we're going to describe this afternoon is, in fact, so strange that coming up with adequate terminology to describe them is itself a challenge. 
there is no direct comparable Western analog to the figures we're going to look at this afternoon. The title that uh, we end up um, um, borrowing from the Russian to describe these figures, Eurodivi, um, is not one for which we have a very good English translation. Um, nonetheless, I think probably the, the, the most adequate way of, of uh, translating that phrase is as holy fools. And we're going to hear uh, later in this conference, in fact, there are a number of uh, presentations on Russian literature where the holy fool uh, is, is a, a stock character in many respects. Um, if you think, for example, of Pushkin's Boris Gudnov, uh, Tolstoy's Childhood, Boyhood, and Youth, and above all, of course, Dostoevsky's uh, Brothers Karamazov. There are numerous examples of fools in all of those, all of those writers, among others. Eurodivi are uh, Christians who take quite literally the Pauline notion of being, in a very real sense, fools for Christ's sake. That phrase that Paul uses in uh, 1 Corinthians 4.10. These fools, he goes on to say, are a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are ill-clad and buffeted and homeless, we have become and are now as the refuse, the off-scouring of the world. The figure of the Eurodivi has increasingly come in for scholarly scrutiny in the last couple of decades, and their behavior has, however, been a topos in hagiographic literature for at least 1,400 years, and their existence has been widely known in Russia for the last 500 years. But they have not, however, been well known or widely studied in the West. And so what I want to do in, in, in what follows this afternoon uh, is uh, five things. Um, first, three very brief descriptive sections talk uh, about uh, examples of holy fools in Scripture. Um, look at just one example, the, the example to which all the literature looks back, uh, of a holy fool from uh, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. Um, a couple of examples from Russia. Um, and then uh, put together a typology of holy foolery and use that as the hermeneutic through which to read or reread uh, two of the central characters in uh, the two mature novels of, of Evelyn Waugh, uh, namely Brideshead Revisited and uh, Helena. In so doing, I'm going to argue that Waugh's use of those characters is to manifest a pedagogical and an apophatic foolishness that treats the mystery of life in Christ in such a way that it cannot be captured by the categories of modern rationality or reduced to the conventions of bourgeois respectability. Rather, the very nature of the God revealed in Christ is one who defies all expectations and exceeds all boundaries in an absurd superabundance of unfathomable love, which is often incomprehensible to most people except those regarded as mental and in some cases moral defectives. So just briefly to look at some examples of foolishness in Scripture then. Um, we have a number of those examples in both the Old Testament uh, as well as the New. Um, we start off with the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, um, who is told by God to start walking naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Ethiopia from Isaiah 20. Ezekiel's instructions are just as infelicitous but in a different way. God tells him first to recline for 390 days on the left side. But as God moves from Ezekiel's bedroom to his kitchen, things get worse for poor Ezekiel, who is told to eat the scroll, and then even more alarmingly instructed, you shall eat a barley cake, baking it in their sight on human dung. To which, naturally enough, Ezekiel objects, whereupon the Lord grants him minor reprieve in saying, see, I will let you have cow's dung instead of human dung, on which to prepare your bread. There are other examples of God doing or instructing other things to do that seem risible or foolish in human terms, but have a purpose in God's plan, usually to instruct or correct the people of Israel or their enemies or both. Examples of that include the postmenopausal Sarah being told she's going to conceive a child, in response to which she laughs in God's face, Hosea taking a whore, Gomer, for his wife. Jeremiah being instructed to go about with thongs and yoke bars on your neck. Zedekiah being told to wear horns of iron. There are other examples in the New Testament, um, but uh, I will not belabor the point. In the New Testament, we get a uh, clearer description of holy foolishness as such. 
Um, although the New Testament is very careful to make clear that foolishness is very carefully teleological and pedagogical in nature. Uh, as John Savard has remarked in his uh, 1980 book on holy foolery, the New Testament never beatifies wisdom or folly in general, but only wisdom or folly under a certain description. In the Gospels, for example, we find Jesus thanking his Father for having hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to babes. It is Paul, of course, who gives us the fullest description of holy foolery and absurd conduct. In the book of Acts, he is himself accused of being a madman for preaching about Christ. It is from Paul's pen that we receive the famous hymn to Christ's absurd self-abnegation, his kenosis, in the famous hymn in the second chapter of Philippians. And of course, it is Paul whose first letter to the Corinthians that puts before us the language of holy, foolie, holy folly several times. In the first chapter, he speaks that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the folly of the wisdom of the world must be scorned so that a fool may become wise. The message, he continues, about the cross is foolishness. And the fool for Christ, in Paul's use of that term, is not merely a rhetorical trope or a polemical device or a theatrical illusion. L. L. Wellborn's careful and insightful word study of this language has shown that when Paul described the message of the crucified Christ as foolishness, he was in fact reflecting the harsh experience of his missionary preaching and the response the gospel elicited, particularly from Greek and Roman intellectuals. This notion that Paul describes will come to take very deep root in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. As forms of Christian sanctity begin to take shape in the empire, in the, the forms of monasticism and other asceticism, we find in the east a category of sanctity that's very unique to this part of the Christian world, the holy fool. In the middle Byzantine period, we find the foundational example of holy foolery to which all subsequent examples will look back, the paradigm, and that is the person known variously to us as Abba Simeon the Fool, portrayed iconographically here, uh, or sometimes simply called Simeon Salos, from the Greek Salos, which is possibly a calc from the Syrian, uh, and which we usually translate simply as the fool or the stupid or the, uh, the, mental, the mentally deranged or the mentally defective one. Simeon was um, the uh, most outrageous example of holy fools, um, this is, of course, a modern cartoon of him, but one of the stories we're told about uh, Simeon is that he dragged a dead dog uh, along uh, wherever he went um, uh, to, uh, to um, sort of scandalize people. But that's the least of what Simeon did, in fact. Um, the, the story of Simeon is, is, uh, is, is, is quite alarming for some people who've never heard it before. Among other things, we're told that Simeon took nuts with him to church on Sunday to throw at people. Um, on other Sundays, he wore a string of sausages about his neck like um, the vestment that um, a deacon would wear, as you see here, what we call the orarian, uh, draped around the shoulder and down the front and held by the deacon in the Byzantine tradition uh, as he's uh, leading the prayers. Simeon, mocking this, has a string of sausages hung around his neck that he's wearing as he's standing at the door into the church. Um, and, with a, and holding a pot of mustard in one hand and dipping the sausage in and eating them. Um, which, of course, would have caused great alarm to people who would have been uh, fasting um, prior to uh, receiving the Eucharist. Um, Simeon, we're told, accepted a job selling lupines, which one scholar says is a legume known to induce ostentatious flatulence. Um, but in fact, he was a very poor salesman. Uh, he ended up giving most of them away and eating the rest uh, himself, <laughs> to the great alarm of the owner of the stall, who came back to find all of the lupines gone and no money in the, in the drawer. Um, Simeon is also said to have rushed willingly into the public baths clearly designated for women um, and pretended in there to have fondled some of the female servants. Um, and Simeon allows himself to be accused falsely, as it would turn out, of having not just fondled uh, one of the servants but having raped her and impregnated her. Um, and Simeon never makes answer to this. Uh, it comes out much later on that, in fact, he was not the father of this child. The, the woman had, had, had lied about it. But Simeon never once raises a voice in his own um, defense. Part of that is deliberate, uh, because part of what the fool does, and, and, and you can sort of plot this out, um, the, the more outrageous outbursts of Simeon and some of the other fools 
are usually timed to the hint that somebody starts to develop that this person may in fact be a saint, or this person may be a messenger of God. And that is what the fool absolutely does not want people to realize or to think. And so as, as, there, is, as there is a hint of of somebody saying, you know what, maybe this person's sent by God. Maybe this is a prophet or a messenger or a saint. It's at that point you see these eruptions of this outrageous behavior of you know, eating in front of church and throwing nuts at people and, and uh, uh, you know, putting themselves in a sexually compromising position um, so that immediately that thought is withdrawn and people realize, no, this guy's just crazy. Um, and that is, uh, that's part of the deliberate nature of the fool to hide the uh, interior life of, of union with God. Simeon, of course, as I said, is the paradigmatic example. Um, There are many others in the Eastern Empire, and I cite them in the notes. Um, But uh, this is the one example to which all others look back um, in uh, in the subsequent development of other forms of fools. Um, As the eastern half of the empire begins its long, slow collapse at the end of the first millennium and in the first uh, centuries of the uh, second millennium until its final domination and destruction uh, by the Ottoman Turks in May of 1453, this whole legacy of the fool in the East passes to the East Slavs, uh, and in particular to the Russians. Um, And it's to the Russian tradition that we'll uh, turn now, because it's there that this whole notion of holy foolery takes root in a way that it does nowhere else in the Christian world. And so we find in Russia an example of what's been referred to as Byzance après Byzance, the ongoing life of the Byzantine Empire long after it had collapsed. Um, and that uh, we see in the, the rise of fools within the Slavic uh, and particularly Russian context. Um, and the, uh, the holy fool has been at the center of Russian self-presentation to the world in that instantly recognizable image that's appeared on countless tourist brochures and websites around the world. This is St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square in the Kremlin. Now, this magnificent cathedral is not, in fact, as you might suspect, dedicated to St. Basil the Great, the outstanding 4th century Cappadocian father and bishop of Caesarea. It is, in fact, dedicated to St. Basil the Fool. St. Basil the Fool, uh, we're told, was born somewhere in the 1460s. The sources are not clear and do not agree. Um, Somewhere near the city of Moscow in in the suburbs of Moscow and died around 1557, and was glorified as a saint in 1588 by the Patriarch of Moscow. About Basil, we're told that in the burning summer heat and in the winter's harsh frost, he walked around barefoot through the streets of Moscow. His actions were strange. Here he would upset a stand with kalachi, which are basically pastries, and there he would spill a jug with kvass, which is a, a primitive kind of beer. Angry merchants throttled Basil, but he endured the beatings with joy and thanked God for them. Then it was subsequently discovered the kalachi were poorly cooked and the kvass was badly prepared. And so the reputation of St. Basil quickly grew and people saw him as a holy fool, a man of God, a denouncer of wrong. There are many other stories about Basil, some of them probably apocryphal. One of them says that Basil was fearless uh, and God protected in challenging Tsar Ivan IV, to whom history has given the suffix the terrible. Basil apparently challenged Tsar Ivan at one point and said to him, you have no need to fast, referring to the the, the period of preparation uh, of great Lent leading up to Easter. In the Orthodox tradition, that's kept uh, very strictly, uh, usually with what today we'd call a vegan diet. Um, At the very least, you would not eat flesh meat. Uh, But Basil goes right up to the uh, the emperor and says, you don't need to fast. It will do nothing for you uh, because you've already shed so much blood, so much human blood, that you don't need to worry about consuming animal blood and animal flesh. Uh, And instead of, you know, Ivan reacting with the kind of tyranny and and, uh, um, fury you would expect, um, he was, we're told, basically struck dumb. Um, And in other sources, we're told that um, Basil uh, so impressed the emperor that uh, uh, Ivan bore uh, Basil's coffin at his funeral. He was a pallbearer for him. Again, some of these stories... Uh, are probably apocryphal, but they give you a sense of, uh, of, of the importance of these figures in Russian history and Russian uh, culture. Um, so there are many examples. Again, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into all of them. I cite some of them in the notes. But one other that I would, um, that I would draw to your attention in passing, um, this is Basil here. Uh, again, uh, sources tell us, you know, going about naked on this icon, 
um, and this sense of communing with Christ in the upper left corner uh, and the city of Moscow itself here um, down, down the bottom. The other one that I would draw your attention to is a much more recent figure from the 19th century. She died somewhere around the year 1803 um, and was more recently glorified as a saint by the Russian church in 1988. This is the one we know as St. Exenia of St. Petersburg. Um, hers is a fascinating example, I think, for transgressing the boundaries of sexual roles. Uh, she married her husband, Andre, as a cavalry officer, and they enjoyed marriage as a young couple until one day he suddenly dropped dead. Um, and this worried his pious wife uh, enormously because um, he had not received uh, the last sacraments of the church. And so what she does on his behalf is to give away all his possessions, give away all their possessions as a married couple, and to don his military uniform and to spend time going around the capital, St. Petersburg as it was then, uh, doing good for people, disguised as her husband, and insisting, even when they recognized her, that they call her by his name. Uh, and her point in doing this was that she wanted any good that she did, serving the poor and helping uh, the suffering, to be accounted to her husband by God as a way of making up for any unrepented sins he may have had at the time of his death. Um, there are, as I say, many other examples. We're not going to, we don't have time to go into all of them. Um, but what I want to do now is sort of look at some of the common features of fools, uh, both ancient and modern, uh, to draw them out and then apply them to uh, some of the characters of Evelyn Waugh. Now, there are a couple of cautions before we go on. Um, and we have to bear in mind that the fools, uh, I think, evade uh, a, a complete exhaustive analysis, especially a psychoanalysis. Um, uh, George Fedotov, in his study of the fools, has said that the life of a holy fool is a perpetual oscillation between moral acts of saving men and immoral acts of insulting them. There's a fundamental instability in the life of the fools which prevents us from ever knowing with complete and absolute certainty whether their outrageous antics are merely pedagogical postures designed to encourage the virtues of faith, hope, and love, or whether they are something else. And in the end, sorting out these questions may not even be all that important. Um, one scholar has written, the fool for Christ's sake behaves incorrectly from the layman's point of view. Nevertheless, he preserves his sanctity on some higher level where these opposites evidently lose their generally accepted meaning. He goes on to say that most fools witness to the neutralization of the purity, dirtiness opposition, as well as similar oppositions between clothed and naked men and women. The fool, in the end, serves as a particular, incidence, uh, or a particular instance of coincidentia oppositorum by being, as the hymnody so often puts it, bodiless in body and surpassing all wisdom by folly. So it's generally accepted then um, that we can never finally, completely, absolutely differentiate the Eurodivi, the fool, from the insane. As Pavel Florensky has put it, it might be insanity, or it might as yet be a special and unrecognized form of incomprehensible wisdom. Callistos Ware, the Oxford Orthodox scholar, has put it uh, succinctly when he says, the fool is equivocal, enigmatic, and always a disturbing question mark. This is deliberate and intentional insofar as the fool seeks to disrupt those who have identified faith and truth with the secularized concepts of moral uprightness and conventional decorum. So these are a couple of the cautions that uh, we want to keep in mind as we, as we continue here. Um, what I want to do now is, is sort of uh, look at a couple of examples of what I would regard as holy foolery in the writings of Evelyn Waugh. Evelyn Waugh, a little later in life, this is a picture from the 1950s. He was born in London in 1903 and died there in 1966. This is him in the last decade of his life. Waugh has generally been regarded um, as the greatest English Catholic writer of the 20th century, and certainly one of the funniest. Um, as you can see here, he's a very prolific author, uh, born, as I said, in 1903 and died on Easter Sunday in 1966. Uh, in, in between, he went to Oxford, uh, married twice, raised seven children, wrote 18 novels, three biographies, seven travel books, uh, many newspaper and magazine articles, and one volume of autobiography. I've listed, I think, all of the major works here in chronological order. In addition to all of his published works, uh, fiction and so on, he was also, many regarded him as being the funniest and most prolific letter writer of his day, 
and also an amusing, if often searingly blunt, diarist. His novels have worn extremely well, almost all of them, together with many of his other works, remaining in print. Penguin, in fact, is bringing out another edition of them, uh, either at the end of this year or the beginning of next. Um, and Alex uh, Alexander Waugh, Evelyn's grandson, told me uh, last summer that Oxford University Press uh, has signed a contract with him to bring out the collected works of Evelyn Waugh uh, in uh, uh, a series projected to run to at least 50 volumes. So his works continue to be read. Um, they also continue to be watched on the big screen. Uh, several uh, adaptations of his novels, Scoop, uh, has been turned into a film. Bright Young People has, has been. Uh, and of course, the utterly enchanting 1981 adaptation for British television of Brideshead Revisited, uh, with the great actors uh, Sir John Gilgood, uh, Sir Laurence Olivier, and a very young uh, Jeremy Irons at the time. So before we look at two of Waugh's novels and the notion of holy fools in them, um, a couple of other cautions that I want to, a couple of other caveats that I want to, uh, uh, I want to make here. Um, the, the character of the fool, especially in the classical Greek forms, uh, Simeon Salos, for example, we're not going to find a direct copy of in any of uh, Waugh's works. Um, there are lots of other fools in the more conventional sense in many of Waugh's novels, people who are portrayed as being stupid, incompetent, uh, malicious, mendacious, uh, and so on. We're not looking at those either. Um, and Waugh makes it very clear who's who, the ones that are genuine, uh, genuinely stupid versus, the, versus the, uh, the holy fool. The other point I think it's important to keep in mind is that Waugh um, may not have himself, being the famously irascible figure that he was, um, liked this analysis of some of his characters. Uh, in part because Waugh um, had a very dim view of uh, all non-Roman Catholic Christian traditions. Uh, Waugh was a convert to Catholicism, received uh, in 1930, uh, and remained a very staunch and unapologetic Roman Catholic uh, for the rest of his life. Um, his conversion in 1930 was, in fact, a very unpropitious time for relations between Christians uh, in the pontificate of Pope Pius XI, um, for reasons that I mentioned in the notes. Um, within days of his conversion, uh, Waugh is under contract with uh, at least one London newspaper to go to Abyssinia, as it was then called, Ethiopia, uh, to cover the uh, coronation of its new emperor. Um, and he had written of the Abyssinians that they were nominally Christian and deplorably lax in their morals. Uh, he bought into a lot of stereotypes about Eastern Christians. In one article that results from his trip to Abyssinia, uh, he ends up mocking the, uh, the Orthodox liturgy that he saw there, um, the, uh, the um, Alexandrian rite in its Abyssinian recension in his article, A Coronation in 1930. Um, and in other places, he very unfavorably contrasts Eastern Orthodox liturgies with Roman Catholic liturgies of the time. Um, but Waugh has no understanding of Eastern Christianity at all in any serious sense, uh, either in his liturgy or in its wider tradition. Uh, he's, he's trafficking in um, some, some pretty... Um, clear stereotypes in much of his treatment. Nonetheless, I'm going to press on because I think that there are two characters that do embody uh, uh, many of the aspects of the Holy Fool, and I think uh, we may um, come to a deeper understanding of two of those characters uh, by looking at them uh, through, this, uh, through this hermeneutic. Uh, these two characters, Sebastian and Helena, are at the heart of, um, of um, uh, two of Waugh's mature uh, novels. Uh, this is a, kind of a standard Byzantine icon of, of uh, Helena here with her son, her famous son Constantine the Great, the emperor on the left, um, and then a, a standalone uh, modern version of, uh, of Helena here. And then a scene from the 1981 British adaptation of the novel Brideshead with uh, uh, Lord Sebastian Flight here in the foreground uh, sitting beside his, his friend uh, Charles Ryder there. Um, in one of the scenes of, of their um, uh, having escaped from his family and gone out uh, into the country. And of course, uh, in the far back there, uh, we can see uh, Sebastian's infamous teddy bear, Aloysius. Um, this very um, uh, sort of hedonistic uh, phase in their life in which it's uh, consumed with uh, good food, good wine, and uh, uh, escaping into a sort of fantasy world later on. Of course, as we're going to see, um, a very different Sebastian um, who uh, does not leave behind his, his youthful Oxford phase of uh, excessive drinking and will uh, die 
uh, in a monastic hospital in North Africa uh, from uh, cirrhosis of the liver, more or less. Um, Waugh does not portray either Helena or Sebastian in the categories of the Holy Fool, but I think, as I said, there is some profit in trying to understand um, both of these uh, characters in this uh, light. Um, a couple of other things to keep in mind here as we, as we go along. Um, Waugh in both Brideshead and Helena has often been, uh, I think, wildly misunderstood uh, and, and accused of several things for which I do not think there's sufficient evidence. It was very common, especially after the Second World War, to portray Waugh as uh, nothing more than this kind of arch snob um, who was concerned with nothing more than um, uh, sucking up to the aristocratic classes uh, and um, trying to ingratiate himself with the rich and the wealthy. I've written elsewhere uh, showing that uh, uh, neither of those charges has any foundation behind them. Um, Waugh does not, in fact, in this novel, um, um, suck up to uh, the rich and the wealthy. And in fact, in both Brideshead and Helena, there are instances of very wealthy, very powerful people being portrayed uh, in very negative light. So he doesn't romanticize either the poor or the rich or indulge in any kind of gratuitous denigration of either of them. Um, both Brideshead and Helena have also been, I think, mischaracterized as just Catholic propaganda, conversion stories um, that seek to sort of draw people into the Catholic faith. Um, and I don't think that uh, that's, the, that's the case uh, in either one. And in fact, um, Waugh was very clear in his, uh, in his, uh, his letters in response to uh, critics that uh, this was not, uh, in fact, um, Catholic propaganda. Uh, he was not, in fact, trying to um, beat people over the head with, uh, with Catholicism. Um, we turn to uh, a typology of holy fools now uh, and, and use this uh, ninefold typology that comes from John Soward um, to help us appreciate, I think, a little bit more um, the nature of Sebastian at the heart of Brideshead and the nature of Helena at the heart of the novel under uh, her own name. Um, and uh, uh, Soward is right to stress that there's no one type. In his book, he says, folly for Christ's sake is itself... Uh, um, uh, a, diver a diverse phenomenon. The communion of saints is a mystery of unity and diversity, not of regimented uniformity. And he gives us these nine uh, ways of trying to categorize and understand um, fools. And the first he posits is the fool has to be very clearly focused on Christ. That's one of the key signs that's going to help you distinguish whether this person is genuine or not. Um, is this person doing something, acting in a particular way, so that it reminds you of or points you towards the person of Jesus Christ. So the fool has to have a life that's Christocentric. Um, and he says the fool has to find his inspiration in his or her identity with Christ crucified, with participation in the Lord's poverty, mockery, humiliation, nakedness, and self-emptying. Under this score, I think we have to say Sebastian does not start off uh, with Christ as the clear focus. You know, if we go back to um, this picture of him uh, at Oxford, um, Sebastian's leading a very carefree life of, of um, uh, indulging in all of the senses, all of the passions, and doing so quite deliberately and quite unapologetically. But it's later on, it's the later Sebastian that uh, we find, uh, or in whom we can see certain aspects of, of the suffering of Christ. Um, and it's later on that he's described in the novel by, for example, his sister Cordelia, um, as one who is, in fact, close to Christ. She says of Sebastian, whom she's not seen in years because he leaves England and, and uh, takes up with his homosexual partner um, and spends uh, his later years dying of alcoholism, basically, in North Africa. But she says of him, he's still loved, you see, wherever he goes, whatever condition he's in. It's a thing about him he'll never lose. And speaking about those who suffer, she says, I believe they're very near and dear to God. And then talking more particularly about Sebastian's, in many cases, self-inflicted suffering, she says to Charles, one can have no idea what the suffering may be, to be maimed as he is, no dignity, no power of will. No one is ever holy without suffering. And in fact, Waugh himself confirms the idea that, that Sebastian um, is a, a, a form of, of uh, Christocentric suffering. In a letter he wrote in 1955, he said, I'm glad you find Sebastian an interesting character. I don't think he had any egotism. He was a contemplative without the necessary grace of fortitude. 
With his outer beauty goes an inner purity. Does Helena have a certain Christocentric orientation to her? And here I think she does in some ways. Uh, and there's a couple of clear examples of that. Um, Helena has a capacity, especially in the first part of the novel, um, to ask these startling questions that completely disorient um, the people to whom she poses them. And if you think of some of the encounters of Christ with uh, various uh, interlocutors in the Gospels, you'll see a certain uh, similarity there. Um, she's also, in fact, not what people expect of a queen in many ways. Helena, of course, is at the top of the Roman social hierarchy as the Dowager Empress, the mother to the Emperor Constantine. Um, and in the novel, uh, she's described as being a golden legend. They expected someone very old and very luxurious, and they rather hoped gentle. Instead, they met a crank, and more than a crank, a saint. It was altogether too much. They were prepared to meet demands for delicacies of the table and elaborate furniture. They had secured a quite passable orchestra from Alexandria, one of the many anachronisms Waugh puts into his text. Um, what Helena wanted was something of quite another order. She wanted the true cross. And the story of Helena is, is what Waugh regards as a kind of a historical fiction, centered on the life of the, uh, the Dowager Empress and her pursuit of the, uh, what remained of what came to be called the true cross. She does not herself grow up as a Christian, but later in life becomes a Christian, and then starts asking questions like, well, you Christians are constantly talking about this cross. You've got pictures of the cross on your church and on your walls, and you make the sign of the cross on your bodies. Well, where is this cross if it's so important? And people say, well, we don't know. Uh, and so this starts her on her, uh, her life's vocation to go to Jerusalem and to the Holy Land to find, uh, to find the cross. Savard says next that folly is a charism. It's something that's a gift. Uh, it's not something that you take on yourself. Uh, it's a vocation and a gift uh, from God. Does Sebastian have such a charism? Is he given a gift and a vocation from God? Um, that is not entirely clear in the novel. Uh, Cordelia, once more, so often the voice of a very kind of direct and piercing assessment of people, uh, says that she thinks Sebastian may have had a vocation at one point, by which she means in uh, Catholic lingo of the time, a vocation to become a priest. Um, but later on, she's not sure that, uh, that he did have a vocation. Um, but she does nonetheless think that he has a vocation um, to what the Russian uh, Orthodox um, theologian Paul Levdekimov has called interiorized monasticism. And as we see him in lying in this, this Franciscan hospital in North Africa, um, that's what he's reduced to, uh, to a life of suffering and prayer of an interior life of a monk, even though he's not a formally professed um, monastic. The charism, what's the charism, what's the vocation of Helena? Um, it's very clear that she has one purpose in life. Law makes this very clear in the novel, and her purpose is to go and find the true cross. Um, and in fact, in one of his letters later on to a reader, he says, I liked Helena's sanctity because it's in contrast to all that moderns think of as sanctity. She wasn't thrown to the lions. She wasn't a, con a contemplative. She wasn't poor and hungry. She didn't look like an El Greco. She just discovered what it was God had chosen for her to do, and she did it. And she snubbed Aldous Huxley with his perennial fog by going straight to the essential physical historical fact of the redemption. Savard next uh, says that uh, holy fools are simulating their foolery. They're, they're acting a little bit. They play at being mad. The sacred jester, the clown, the mimic. The fool leads a double life on stage, in the streets by day, an imbecile in private, in church at night. He is a man of prayer. Um, that, I think, is, you know, Savard is a Western, uh, he's a Roman Catholic theologian, and I think he betrays a little bit of a Western bias there. Because the examples of fools we do have in the West do often come across as the holy jester, the one who's playing. In the East, it's much harder to draw that line, uh, and the, the boundaries, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, a lot uh, more blurred. And this is very clearly the case with the Sebastian. We don't know with him. You know, he starts off this, this, uh, this incredibly um, hedonistic life early on that seems to have nothing to do with uh, Christianity, as many people would conceive of it. You know, he insists on carting his teddy bear around with him. He buys a hairbrush for the teddy bear. Uh, I have to have red pillow box pajamas, he says. You know, I have to eat these plover's eggs. I have to drink champagne. We have to drink this wine with these strawberries under this tree at this moment. You know, th th his, his life, we're told, is governed by this series of very childlike or childish imperatives. So we're never entirely clear um, with Sebastian whether he's 
entirely playing or whether there's something else going on. Um, with Helena, again, the boundaries blurred a bit with her as well. Um, there are periods in the novel in which she seems to play at being a dunce, at the very least, if not um, uh, someone who's taken complete leave of her senses. Um, and there are hints of that back and forth, usually at points of danger in her life, uh, in which she pretends to be not nearly as smart as she is so that people leave her alone. Uh, folly is often uh, described in eschatological terms, concerned with the end times. Um, and I think here both Sebastian and Helena were to some extent um, asking or acting uh, eschatologically. Um, because it's very hard, and a lot of readers over the years have said, well, look at Sebastian, look what he's reduced to. What kind of life is this? What good is this, right? What, what, what purpose does this serve? He starts off a young man full of promise, described with great beauty, comes from a very wealthy family. And what does he do? He squanders it away on, on homosexuality and alcoholism. What purpose could Sebastian have? Uh, and Waugh leaves the question open. Um, and, and in fact, hints that we don't know. And in human earthly terms, his life does look like a waste. But that doesn't mean there isn't some purpose for him in the age to come. Um, Helena, uh, her life, I think, is what uh, we could call an example of realized eschatology. Uh, and by that, um, I turn to the very last lines of the novel in which Waugh says that her work was finished. She had done what only the saints succeed in doing, what indeed constitutes their patent of sanctity. She had completely conformed to the will of God. Her life points beyond to the age to come. Above all the babble of her age and ours, she makes one blunt assertion, and there alone lies hope. The fifth typical example or uh, characteristic of fools is the fool as a pilgrim. Um, and I think we see that uh, clearly in both Sebastian and Helena. What is Sebastian's uh, patronymic? What's his family name? Lord Sebastian Flight, F-L-Y-T-E. Names are always chosen with, uh, with deliberate intent in, in Waugh's writings. And, and, and Sebastian very much lives up to all of the connotations of that term. He's forever flitting about from place to place. He's not a person who can or uh, uh, can be satisfied with being tied down in one place. He's a constant pilgrim in that sense, even if not in a formal, a formal way. He's always on the road from London to Oxford, back to London, back to Oxford, to Venice, to um, other parts of Europe, uh, to Italy, ultimately to, to uh, North Africa, where he'll spend the rest of his life. And Helena, of course, very clearly, her life is governed by pilgrimage. The entire latter half of the novel uh, is, is portrayed with her pilgrimage um, from basically the Dalmatian coast into the Holy Land uh, to find the remnants of the true cross. One of the other key things in the life of a fool is they, ha they operate typically in a stable social and political context. Uh, in a time of great turmoil and, and upheaval, you don't often find fools. Uh, their life presupposes a certain stability that they themselves will try to upset. Um, the holy fool most often appears at a time of uh, political tranquility. That's clearly the case in both Sebastian and Helena. Sebastian's life in the novel, uh, in the interwar period, um, uh, is portrayed as being quite stable, um, uh, in part because he comes from an extremely wealthy family. Uh, they're able to ride out... Um, the uh, economic difficulties of the 1920s and the 1930s, which is the, the period of the novel. And Helena, of course, has a very stable life at the, at the absolute pinnacle of, of Roman power um, by virtue of her being um, the Dowager Empress. She's not uh, subject to, to the change. Uh, the discernment of spirits uh, is also an important characteristic in trying to figure out, is this person a fool? Are they just playing at it? Are they insane? Uh, and uh, an attempt is, is often made to try and figure out what's really going on. That's a question that Waugh doesn't give a clear answer to as far as Sebastian's concerned, um, but he does hint at it in the example of Helena. Um, and in fact, um, she herself seems to want to know for sure, what is it exactly I'm supposed to do? Um, am I supposed to go and find the, 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 the cross or not? And part of the way she discerns those spirits and comes up with an answer uh, is through uh, the dream that she's sent in the novel. Um, and she takes that as a sign of confirmation from God that her vocation is to go and find the cross. Um, the last two characteristics of the fool, um, the extreme apathia uh, of the fool is a very characteristic hallmark. We get uh, from the Greek apathia, we get the word apathy in English, but there are some pretty significant differences in connotation between the two. 
Uh, apathy for us is often uh, you know, a, a synonym for lethargy or boredom or depression or uh, ennui. Um, but it has a, a, a different meaning in the Greek, a pathos, without passion. Um, because the passions, especially in the Greek uh, patristic literature, um, most notably in Evagris of Pontus, the passions are the things you do not want. You know, you've got somebody coming for a job interview today, and we say, well, tell us about yourself. You know, what, what are you passionate about? You know, well, I like French cooking or, you know, uh, whatever. Um, taken as a good thing. Not so in the patristic literature. The passions are what you want to escape from. The passions are those disordered tendencies, those logismi, as Evagris calls them, um, lust, avarice, gluttony, anger, pride, and so on. These disordered desires, these disordered thoughts um, that we would come through Gregory uh, the Great and others in the West to know as the seven uh, capital uh, vices or the seven deadly sins. Um, Savard says that holy fools are extreme ascetics who have achieved that apathia that the Greek fathers referred to. They are simply immune to those very fleshly temptations. Um, neither Helena nor Sebastian, I think we have to say, um, could be said to, to practice that kind of extreme um, apathia, that kind of extreme asceticism. Um, but there are hints of it in both cases. There are a couple of hints early on in Brideshead, um, when uh, before Sebastian's decline, when he and Charles are still friends, uh, Charles comes to spend a summer at Brideshead, the, the, uh, the ancestral family uh, estate, um, and uh, they get onto a conversation about religion. Charles, for most of the novel, is an agnostic. Um, and Sebastian, of course, comes from this long-standing Catholic recusant family. And they get into a brief conversation about Catholicism, and, and Sebastian says, oh, you have no idea what it's like to be a Catholic. You have no idea of the, of the strictures of being a Catholic. But he doesn't go into uh, great detail. Uh, just kind of hints at some of the ascetic practices that uh, are expected of, of Catholic Christians. Uh, it's much clearer in the case of Helena. Um, she does, in fact, have a very severe ascetic tendency uh, that comes out to the great surprise of many of, of the people in her, her entourage who expect that as a woman of great power, she's going to have a taste for the finer things in life, and in fact, she disdains all of those. Uh, she goes to live in a very simple convent uh, where she's described as having lost weight, um, and, uh, and she's described as having settled in a single small room among the nuns of Mount Zion, where she did her own housework and took her turn in waiting at table. She's indifferent to her own comfort and indifferent to those who beg her to consider her age and her health. Helena was exempt from all obligation, but she decided nonetheless to fast. It seemed to her a matter of practical expediency. This is after she's moved to Jerusalem and has not had success in finding the cross. Tried various tactics, and so she decides, well, I'm going to fast and see if the Lord shows me where to go. Uh, she had exhausted, Wall writes, all the natural means of finding what she, shall, what she sought. Very well, she said, I will see what fasting do, will do. And fasting, as Wall would describe it later on, means quite simply to starve. In Jerusalem, if you wished to attain the rewards of fasting, you lived on water and thin gruel and nothing else. And so Helena is a very clear example of someone who practices that um, very demanding form of asceticism. And finally, the final characteristic uh, of a childlikeness among fools. Uh, and, and fools were often um, uh, described as childlike rather than childish, uh, protected, that is, by their simplicity and their purity of heart, a form of spiritual uh, infancy. Now, there's certainly many examples of, of Sebastian, as we, as we saw briefly, acting in a very sort of childish or adolescent way, um, particularly in the early part of the, uh, of the novel. Um, but there are some other examples that I'm, I'm not sure are entirely um, so clear as, as to how we would categorize them. Um, after Sebastian his, uh, is, uh, uh, throws up in uh, Charles' rooms at Oxford because he had too much to drink, um, he sends him um, this very elaborate sort of apology um, uh, written in Conte crayon on a whole sheet of my choice Watman drawing paper. I am very contrite, Sebastian writes. Aloysius won't speak to me the teddy bear, until he sees I am forgiven. So please come to luncheon today, signed Sebastian Flight. There are other examples, again, we've mentioned a few of them, that blur the line uh, as to whether Sebastian is, is uh, you know, uh, simply acting or whether he is, in fact, um, someone uh, who is, in some ways, uh, never grown up. Um, 
And for her part, Helena uh, does also embody certain characteristics we often associate with children. A very stubborn, single-minded determination to do what she thinks is right, no matter how many times uh, people uh, try to talk her out of it. Um, as one of Waugh's biographers uh, has described it, Helena is a practical, commonsensical girl, always asking questions that seem childlike to the worldly folk around her. The novel's other characters simply serve to contrast with Helena's inspired simplicity. Just a, a couple of final uh, characteristics by way of conclusion. Uh, in addition to these sort of nine um, uh, commonly encountered characteristics of fools, um, there are a couple of others that we find uh, among many of them as well. Um, the fool does not make an attempt to um, uh, explain him or herself or to draw others into what's assumed to be his or her very intense prayer life. Um, they are, in fact, loners, and I think we can go so far as to call many of them losers, um, notwithstanding their, so their social station. You know, Sebastian, again, comes from a very wealthy family, Helena, the Dowager Empress, but neither of them have uh, close friends, and neither of them have a following. They don't have people who look to them for spiritual or other advice. Um, and so they don't have followers, and they're not interested in a lot of the affairs of regular human life, especially politics, uh, which Waugh himself very famously scorned. Um, and social reformers, politicians, and journalists in uh, Waugh's corpus are almost invariably figures of mockery um, who are treated very savagely um, by, by, uh, by Evelyn Waugh. And Waugh makes the point that if you chase after the world's wisdom and welfare, all you do is make yourself into this, this obnoxious busybody. Um, uh, and you don't intend, you don't attend rather to the transformation of the human heart. And this is true for both Sebastian and Helena. Neither of them are political reformers. Neither of them are out there seeking to start a cause uh, or change the world. Uh, and Wall makes this very clear in Helena's case. Chapter five of the novel is entitled, A Post of Honor is a Private Station. And he's referring to Helena's middle age in which she lives very quietly by herself on the Dalmatian coast, far away from the politics of of Rome um, and the empire, uh, in which she has really no need at all. And in fact, she makes it very clear. She says at one point to her son with great, uh, of course, historical irony, um, that, uh, that uh, you know, he should try and stay out of politics. Um, to, which, uh, you know, to which Constantine responds, you don't understand modern politics, mama. There are no private lives nowadays. Um, and so she, uh, uh, very much follows that type of, of, uh, of the fool who abstains from the, the, the world of politics. Uh, and so in conclusion then we've seen, I think um, both Helena and Sebastian are examples of holy fools, different to be sure from each other, different from earlier models, uh, and different in that neither conforms to any previous type. But that is itself a characteristic of the fools, their great diversity. And so in the end I think, uh, Evelyn Waugh offers us these foolish characters to teach us that the mystery of life in Christ cannot be captured by the categories of rationality or reduced to the conventions of bourgeois respectability. In the final analysis, the Eurodivi are to be understood not as psychologically deranged, but as an embodiment of mystery. <laughs>